Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Unfortunately, my camera is also off today, but I hope you're all doing very well. Welcome back to our Catalyze Programs monthly webinar series. This month, I am very happy to introduce our speaker, Mr. David Rothkopf, who is the president of Medicept Incorporated and an expert in a variety of regulatory, compliance management, and quality processes involved in the spectrum of commercialization. And today's presentation is really designed to give you a better understanding of feasibility design control in the development and regulatory control of medical devices. So with that, I will go ahead and turn the floor over to David for a much more in-depth introduction to himself and his background. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I just want to have you, uh... Happy afternoon, uh, happy morning. Um, the purpose of this training really is to provide a, a general overview of design controls during the feasibility stage and sort of early clinical evaluations. The point of it is to go and provide the information that you're going to need to collect at that early stage um, so that the a process of developing your product at a later stage, uh, once you've passed feasibility and moved into uh, sort of the, the development side, um, makes life a little bit easier. A little bit about me first. Um, my name is David Rothkoff. Um, I started off in the aerospace industry back in uh, the 80s uh, and then moved into the medical world. I have been a design engineer, a manufacturing engineer. Uh, I worked in operations, setting up factories. I set up uh, two factories in Europe uh, in the 90s. Uh, and then I moved into quality and regulatory. Um, I've started four medical device companies, uh, have sold two of them, and have started two consulting firms. And as a consultant at Medicept, we mostly work with startups, early stage startups, um, either physicians that come up with a great idea, academics that come up with a great idea. And then we sort of hold their hand as they walk through the process, not only of developing their product, but also getting through the FDA and the European regulators. So some of the topics that we're going to hit, we're going to just do some general comments about design control and, and feasibility. Then we're going to talk a little bit about design inputs, which are user needs and, and how to really solve a problem um, that is out there. One of the issues that we find often is that companies come up or, or individuals come up with a solution and they're looking for a problem that they can solve. Um, and what we usually say is, well, let's, let's look at the problem first, and then let's see how we can use the solution. Design outputs, verification documentation, and that's really um, sort of early stage prototype testing, early stage um, review of where your product is and, and, and where you want to go. And that includes some level of lot traceability. And then lastly, we'll talk about early feasibility studies. So some general comments about design control. Design control is sort of like planning a trip. It, it can be really daunting when you think about it. And, and really, when you um, think about design control, you have to think about, you, mo most people think about it as something that occurs well after feasibility, well after prototyping. But when you want to, but you want to really plan a trip early to make sure you get the plane tickets, you get the hotels, you get the things that you need. You might not know where you're going yet. You might not have like a full idea, but you know you need a trip. You know you need, you know you have the basic ideas, you know, whether you're going to go skiing or swimming or sightseeing. And, you have to think about, is it going to be you? Is it going to be their whole family? Um, is it going to be others? But you need some basic information and this is why design control is so important. You don't mind going up to us, going on a ski trip, but if you brought your shorts and t-shirts, 
um, that means you didn't really plan very well. And the whole point is to start doing what you need, what you only need to do at the beginning. And, and you don't want to do too much because you don't want too much to be down on paper, so to speak, especially if you believe that there's going to be lots of changes. The other point is, is for all the technology and everything, regulators, FDA, ISO, still judge you by paper. Um, they don't review your code. They don't look at your product or your surgical techniques. They don't look at any of that, um, actually. They simply look at documentation to determine if you've developed, an, it developed your innovation appropriately, safely. How did you test it? Um, it's a tough thing to remember, especially if you're working on software or imaging products, or if you're er the early, early stage. Again, design control is really sort of the manifestation of a scientific method. Who, what are you trying to do? Who, what is the problem statement? How do you provide a hypothesis um, to solve your problem? How do you check those risks and test the hypothesis? And then documenting your conclusion. One thing to point out here is that design control is commonly thought of as for medical devices. And it's very common for, for individuals to say, well, I'm not creating a medical device. I'm creating a, a scaffold for a cardiac product. Well, the, the term medical device is actually a very, very broad term in the FDA and ISO's world. And anything that really doesn't use a chemical reaction could be considered a medical device and, and to follow design controls. Even with that said, design controls in some facsimile has leached its way into um, pharmaceutical development and the requirements to go and document your inputs and your outputs and look at risk management and verification testing is now into, is in uh, uh, pharmaceutical development. A little quick joke, um, why is design control needed? Um, you know, what the customer really wants is something on the lower right-hand side, but everybody else has their own idea about what the, what the customer really wants. Unless, of course, you fully understand the user needs. Um, sometimes the customer doesn't even explain what the problem is in, in that upper right-hand, upper left-hand corner. Um, they sort of want to swing, but they're really not sure what they want. And even the project debt leaders and, and the individuals who are analyzing it really sometimes miss what they're actually looking for. So it's just a quick little joke, um, but it, you'd be surprised at how often um, this joke turns into reality. Really quickly, um, design controls are applicable for certain types of classifications of devices. Um, and uh, uh, we won't really go into classifications all that much, um, but there are three classifications both within the FDA and there are four plus uh, classifications with Europe and other uh, countries. For design controls legally, um, you're required to do design controls for class two and class three to medical devices. That's the bulk, honestly, of medical devices. Um, if you think about things like uh, a stent or even something as similar, as simple as an electric toothbrush, um, you're talking about those types of devices. Some class one devices actually require design controls too. Actually, anything that's, that is connected with software has to have a level of design control. Uh, something that, that would be a class one that's not, uh, that doesn't need design control, yet I will tell you the FDA will still look for some type of development documentation is say something like a, a, a rigid scope. Um, that would be considered a class one. There's no electronics. It's really just a, a, a scope to look down, uh, say a bronchioscope. And this is applicable 
not only for, for FDA, as I mentioned, but also in the EU uh, and the rest of the world. They, they all have some level of a design control process. And really, it's because back in the 90s, I guess I'll say, um, we kept seeing the, the FDA and several other people kept seeing multiple recalls. And honestly, you still see them today because products were not properly developed in a consistent, planned manner. Um, you'll, you see that today with a lot of recalls um, that are going on right now, whether it's something as uh, egregious as what's going on with Philips and their CPAP machine where they just designed the product with the wrong foam um, that, that degraded over a long period of time and then uh, unfortunately ends up in people's lungs and has, gives them infections, or um, even something as, as benign, um, well, it's not benign, but the problem itself is, is believe it or not, is benign, is, is like a hardware LVAD, which is a left ventricle assist device. The, the product is really, really critical. It's a, it's a replacement for your heart. But what actually caused the recall and what caused all the problems was the fact that the battery, a simple Duracell battery, did not last as long as they said it would. And the alarm system was not long enough to allow uh, a patient to go get it recharged. And those are simple design controls that should have been sort of reviewed early, early on the feasibility stage, um, not, not well after, well after they had implanted pr uh, products into the patients. So again, legally, the, the problem once you have the, the, the legally, where you see that line on the left-hand side, that's sort of where FDA wants you to start doing uh, design controls. Uh, they want you to go over and do design controls after feasibility and the requirements have been stated. The problem is once you've completed feasibility, you already have many of the requirements and the prototype is sort of semi-solidified and thus the design controls have already started. And FDA already expects you, um, and, and ISO, sorry, um, have already expects you to have this information almost on day one. So with, especially with software, you really need to start doing the basics of design control early on. In addition, according to FDA's um, clinical evaluation process, the design verification activities and the design control itself has to be initiated. So although you might be running some feasibility studies, some clinical feasibility studies, FDA sort of expects you to have a product that is safe, um, somewhat effective, or at least some level of knowledge that you're not going to go over and injure a human being when you are uh, testing off this product. One thing that I usually ask companies to do or clients to do right off the bat is really to start thinking about uh, like, why are you doing this? Um, what's the problem you're solving? Um, as we mentioned before, if you're planning a trip, you need to know the basics. Who's going on the vacation with you? Is it going to be just you and a spouse? Is it going to be your kids? Is it going to be your grandparents or your parents? Um, even if the trip is six months away or eight months away, you should know basically who's going on the trip. You know, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Those are user needs. Those are basic user needs, or 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 as um, as we talk about here, um, sort of related to the intended use. And then you should record them. So you have some guidelines, some boundaries. It helps you focus again on what's really important. If, if we're using the same trip, met, trip uh, metaphor, if I'm gonna go on a skiing trip, I know approximately the time period of the, of the year I have to go. I know approximately where we're going to be going. It could be in, the, it could be in Europe, it could be in the United States, or it could be during the summer down in the Southern hemisphere but at least it gives you some boundaries of what you need to do versus just 
really throwing paint at a wall. Um, I, I have been, uh, I, I teach many classes and in many different academic uh, settings. And a lot of times people are, are really just wanna play for lack of a better word. And that's totally great. And you can get grants for playing and, and it really does move the knowledge and technology along by just playing. But at some point in time, that playing has to start solidifying. And that's where we're talking, that's what we're talking about here. Um, you don't have to be complete, but you should write them down. Write down the basics, write down the basics of what your intended use is, what your indications are. If you've got some basic design requirements, um, I would start writing those down also. So what is what is what am I actually talking about here? I have this sort of grid here which you can utilize just sort of as a tickler to remind you, you know, who can use the product. It's it's the who, what, when, where, and how sort of, of mentality of how to create the inputs. Again, this is feasibility. So you might not know most of these answers. Um, but you should know approximately who's going to be using your product. Um, or is it going to be done, used in surgery? Is it going to be uh, used before surgery? Is it going to be a take-home product? Um, it will help you sort of solidify and solve your problem. It, it gives some structure around the whole process. You know, feasibility should show the benefit to an existing technique or technology, um, you know, no matter what type of existing technology or, or techniques you're talking about. And that this type of, of documentation, early stage documentation, will help um, solidify that. One last point about design inputs. Eventually, you will start recording your requirements so that you know exactly how to build your product. You know, what type of standards, we'll discuss about that in two seconds, but what type of standards, what type of specifications, what type of alarms? I've worked with many companies that go head forward into prototypes without really understanding <clears throat> what they want or what regulations they have to follow. You know, if you design and build a prototype and then realize you didn't meet the IEC 60601, which is electrical safety, then you have to start all over again and actually redesign the product. We had a client that uh, they had finished the design. Uh, they had actually done most of their testing. Uh, they had gone through feasibility through breadboards. They had spent a lot of money on on eventually on um, molds and uh, PCBs. And then they decided to test the product uh, for electrical safety and it failed. And they had to go back, almost back to breadboard development because the to fix their problem, they needed to change their PCB and the landscape had to change, which meant the molds had to change. If they had gone originally and thought about the testing that was required, if they thought about the regulations and the, the how to design the product early stage, early during the early prototypes in the breadboard stage, as I mentioned, they would have probably saved themselves tons of time and tons of problems. Even in my early companies, and this is I'm, I'm admitting something to, to my closest 87, 90 friends right in front of you. Um, uh, or even in my, one of my early companies, we designed a product and it worked great on a cadaver. It worked great during animal studies, um, but the engineers didn't actually use the right materials. And when we tested it for MRI compatibility, it failed. And we had to go back and redesign with different materials for, uh, to, to, to ensure that the product was MRI compatible. So it, it, it was an extra, gosh, maybe six months and maybe about 
a million, maybe $2 million worth of, of additional work. And this was, again, it wasn't even close to, to final uh, product. It was still early stage product. But we didn't think, we weren't looking holistically at what type of regulations and what type of testings might be necessary. One last point I'm gonna talk about with is, is agile development. If anybody knows what agile development is, it's sort of um, you start with something, you identify some of the requirements, you go to a, a TBD, a to be determined, and then you go, you, you work as much as you can on that, then go back and start all over again. It's, it's a good way of sort of designing a product especially if you don't have all the answers in front of you. Um, there are many times when you start working on a product and it's a more of, a, a, of an academic thesis, but so you don't have all the answers in front of you. And it takes some time to sort of, what are my real requirements and working those out in your head and, and actually in the product. And agile development sort of helps you with that methodology. One last thing in addition to, to agile development, and this is really uh, as it relates to software. If you are starting, if you have a product that has software, and that could be a product that is not only you, your, your product has software, but also connected to some product that has software, you really need to start um, documenting early, early on. Um, like right off the bat, we had a client come to us and they wanted the FDA to review their, their AI, their artificial intelligence and, and machine learning product. And they had no documentation at all. And about eight months later, after retrospectively writing all the documentation, they thought they were ready. And unfortunately, in this case, not only did they have to create the documentation, but they realized that the appropriate people didn't review their machine learning methodology and their data had some level of biasness and incompleteness. Um, and if they had submitted the documentation and the product as it was, the FDA probably would have rejected it. Um, if they had started IEC 62304 from the early beginning and had put the barriers around it, sort of guided the company, guided the developers, they probably would have found this problem much, much sooner and, and much easier. It is really difficult to, to think about uh, software, uh, especially software developers, to think about paperwork, I should say, uh, especially software developers, because you just want to sit down and code. I, I've coded in my life, and you just want to sit down and code and test and test and try and try. But if you don't sit back and do your homework first, you end up with a lot of wasted code and a lot of inefficient processes. Two quick little side points that I'd like to talk about is one, human factors. This is a picture I just really love. Um, um, for most medical devices, uh, the most important goal is of, of human factors or use, usability is to minimize use-related hazards and risks, and then confirm that these efforts were successful and the user can actually use your product safely and effectively. Um, specifically, specific beneficial outcomes of applying human factors to medical devices, including you know, you know, how we teach clients during feasibility to write a storyboard or a surgical technique just to help with the user needs and the requirements. Just trying to make you think about how the product is actually going to be used and is the product feasible during the feasibility stage. The hard science is there. Um, but success is measured by people using the innovation and helping patients. Um, it's more than just science. As I, as I said, we, we, it's there to solve a problem. So you want to make sure that you get the best solution and that the best solution is usable. So if you 
at the early stages, create a storyboard, a flow process flow chart. Um, think about macroscopically and, and, and user perception. Um, we 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 ran a uh, we were running a client running with a client, <clears throat> and they came up with a really really great product um, that unfortunately no one would use uh, because it was so complicated that even the physicians uh, that there were their their advisors uh, at the early early stages when they were doing early stage cadaver studies said that they they would need three hands to actually use this product. Um, yes, it was really great. The time, the science was all there. The technology was there, but the usability was not. And again, this was early stage. This was, um, I think they may had made three prototypes and it was, uh, they were prototypes that were made literally on a kitchen table. Uh, and then they brought them in with the doctors to run it on cadavers. And the doctors said, we can't, we can't use this from an engineer. It looks great from a, from a real use point of view, we couldn't use it. Tied to that is risk management. Um, just really think about risk in the feasibility stage. You don't really need to do anything formally yet. You don't. You, you may want to take a look at ISO fourteen nine seventy one um, within that guidance document and there in the related TIR guidance document. There it, there are several checklists that you can look at to just again sort of tickle your brain and think about, well, what does this do and how does it do this? How can we go over and make sure that the product is safer and, and, and design it at the early, early stage um, as a design product, as, as a well-designed product, not sort of later on. Um, this sort of goes also into things like false positives, false negatives, um, when we talk to companies that are working on in vitro diagnostics, which, by the way, are also considered medical devices, um, we talk about early, early stage. What do you want? What, do you, what can you live with? What can the industry live with, with a false positive and a false negative? And of course, companies come back and they're like, oh, 100%. But that's not reality. So you really have to think about in the early design stage, in the early feasibility stage, what level of acceptance you can have. Quick little, another quick joke about human factors, Douglas Adams, you know, a common mistake that people make when you're trying to design something completely foolproof is, the, is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. Um, it is just something that you'd be very surprised throughout my career I have seen, uh, products and devices um, used in, inappropriately and incorrectly. Um, design outputs, uh, document your prototypes, have drawing schematics, write your specs so you know what you have. It does not have to be formal, it also, but it also helps you establish your IP, um, your IP timeline. Um, you don't, this way you don't end up repeating yourself and redoing ideas. You need to have this information for any type of feasibility clinical trial. Um, you also pr should probably have this for your, for your large animal trials um, or even cadavers. It's not necessary, obviously, for cadavers, but it helps you with consistency. It doesn't have to be formal. You don't have to have revision control, but you, ha but you should have something that's consistent and, and easily um, available. If you're going to use somebody else to help with design or develop uh, prototypes, Start early, make sure you have confidentiality clauses, make sure you have, uh, you ensure that they are the right people um, that you should be using. Uh, we have, you, we've worked with many, many companies that use third party developers, uh, design developers and, and, and prototype manufacturers. And they sometimes walk down a long road of problems uh, because they didn't use the right people at the beginning. Um, confirm that your you know, early phase uh, design verification is just really confirming that your design outputs meet your design inputs. Um, you know, do you have animal testing, cadaver studies? Uh, something that's really important now early, early on is something called the biological evaluation plan. That will tell you 
what type of uh, biocompatibility testing you need. And the reason why you need this at early feasibility stage is that sim commonly for clinical trials, you need some biocompatibility proof. And as some of you probably know, biological uh, bi uh, biocompatibility testing might take six months if it's, for example, like an implant. Um, genotoxicity tests take a very long time. So doing the plan early on, early during your feasibility is something that is really, really necessary. When you're doing your design verification um, or your early feasibility testing, record how the parts were made, write down acceptance criteria and trace those materials. Um, that way you can prove that it's repeatable. Uh, we've seen it several times where prototypes work once and then they start building more prototypes and miraculously the prototypes start failing. Um, and it's simply because somebody had to tweak the first prototype. They had to use some sandpaper or some, some tape around the product and they didn't record that. They didn't write down exactly how they did it. And they just designed the product and made a couple more parts and then instantly they started to fail. So it's just something that you want to think about when you're doing those early, early phase testing. Early feasibility, um, FDA and uh, EU and the IRBs will be looking for some basic information to accept your study. Um, this is the same exact information that goes into a design history, that goes into a design, design control. So you might as well start in an organized fashion collecting that information. <clears throat> um, as I said before, you know, at, this, at the early stages, design control is legally not required, but the information is the same. So you might as well do it. Uh, last slide before I open it up to questions. Um, early feasibility studies are, as I mentioned in the, in the previous slide, <clears throat> they're sort of a small number of, of human subjects after your, after your, human, after your animal studies. Um, and really, you're, you're evaluating your concepts. You're doing some, some really early clinical functionality, maybe some safety tests. Um, more likely, it will lead to some modifications. Um, but for example, most IDE studies and IRB studies will require an intended use. They'll require uh, clinical objectiveness and investigational plan. Um, they'll require prior investigations and testing information, safety, risk. Um, I've been seeing a lot of IDE studies, um, early er IDE studies, um, where the FDA and, uh, is asking for usability, um, especially if the surgical technique is complex. Um, we've got a client that uh, is, is a, uh, they are injecting uh, something, I'll say, um, I can say stem cells, um, into a cardiac, uh, into a heart that has had, that has had a, a heart attack, into a patient that, who has a heart, <laughs> um, and, but the methodology of getting the needle in there is very specific, and FDA held up the, their preliminary early phase study. I mean, they were only doing it with three humans, um, but they held up the study because of usability. Can the surgeon actually do uh, what they were able to do in the animal studies? One other point that has come about several times, actually, in, in work that I've done, both with the NIH um, and with other early stage companies, is during the IRB and, and the, um, the pre-IDE uh, trials, the FDA and the IRB reviewers are asking for product development. How are you actually going to make your product and how are you going to ensure consistency in the manufacture of the product? They're not looking for full-blown production. They're not looking for, you know, full-blown procedures. They just want to go and ensure that if you've got five patients, that all five patients are going to be using the exact same products. 
um, so that you can go over and get real solid data out of the results. Um, again, this is all the same information that would go into a design control, um, but it's not required by law. Um, it's not required by 820.30, the, the law itself, um, but it's, it's all the same information that FDA and the Europeans based on the new MDR uh, regulations uh, will be asking for. <clears throat> and with that, I am going to open this up for uh, questions. Great, thank you, David. Uh, before we jump into the questions, I did wanna let everyone know that uh, in another minute or two, I'll be opening a feedback poll. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind taking a minute or two to uh, submit your feedback, the project team would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we do have a couple questions in, uh, so please do uh, continue submitting those in the Q&A window. Uh, you can also raise your hand to let us know you'd come off mute. But the uh, first question here uh, from Alan, is there a software package that you would recommend to help guide a small startup through the design control process? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are several software packages. Um, if you're talking about software development, um, something, something like a JIRA um, can actually help. It helps organize your requirements. It helps organize the testing and the traceability. Um, it sort of helps you uh, collect your thoughts early on so that when you're doing your, develop, your software development, you can, um, you can ensure that you, know, you are sort of collecting that, that, that institutional knowledge and that data so that it can be transferred into your product at a later date. As it relates to other things, um, the problem that you run into is um, the sort of vastness of, of medical devices. If I'm, if I'm making a product that is for imaging, um, whether it's a, uh, uh, an MRI-based product, a CAT scan-based product, or if you're using some, if you're going the other side, if you're using some sort of like video, video uh, um, um, bronchioscope or something along those lines, um, the, the differences between the different software packages sort of now play a role. Um, you've got stuff like Greenlight Guru. Um, I know there's a couple of others. Uh, uh, um, uh, Nemedio has a product uh, that helps organize. At this early stage, um, I'm really not sure you need something that's expensive and, and they are expensive. Those systems are, are not inexpensive. Um, uh, I, would, I would suggest really um, something like, a, <laughs> this is, sounds like I'm, I'm gonna show my age, but something like an engineering book, a notebook, something simple like that, where you can just document what is the intended use what are some of the requirements that I'm going to have to meet? What are some of the regulations that I'm going to have to meet? Um, don't, don't spend the money that you don't need, um, that, that you need for your product, I should say. Think about you know, when you need to start doing, you, using those pieces of software officially at a later date. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what is the difference between the terms design control Quality, quality management system and quality control. I see these being used interchangeably often. Ah, there, there's big differences. So, so let's start with the first one. Design control is simply the, a, a plan and a methodology of designing your product. Um, as I stated, you, you, it's as if you are going on a trip. Um, it doesn't say um, you know, how you're going to go on the trip. It's just talking about the fact that you're going on a trip. You need your, your requirements, your drawings, your risk management, um, your verification and validation, things of that nature, that's design control. Quality management system really is related to once the product has been released, now, now design control is a component of, the, of, of a quality management system, but it's just one small component of it. Once the product is released, you have a quality management system. 
that is something like man, uh, um, manufacturing controls. How are you going to consistently ensure? How are you going to ensure that your man, your product can consistently be manufactured appropriately? Um, complaint handling, post market surveillance, um, things like. Uh, corrective actions. Once you are doing a, an audit of yourself, say, or somebody else is doing an audit of you and you find a problem, how are you going to correct that problem in an organized manner? That's quality management systems. Quality control really is tied to inspection. It is how you are going to go and ensure that your product is manufactured appropriately by inspecting your product, that's quality control. And all three of those things sort of work together to ensure that you end up with a safe and effective product out in the, out in the real world. Um, unfortunately, sometimes there are uh, situations where one of the three fail and you end up with a problem out in the world, but, but really all three of them have to work uh, together to ensure safe products. Thank you, David. Uh, next question here from Lynn. Uh, do animal studies conduct, conducted as part of the bench testing protocol need to be done under GLP regulations? So um, <laughs> there's a yes and no answer to this. So I, I apologize for my FDA, FDA like it depends answer. Um, if you are going to submit the data from the animal study, then it needs to be under GLP. If you are using it just for feasibility, just to prove that your design is good, that you know you may wanna make some changes, then I wouldn't spend the money on the GLP side of things. Um, it's, it's a lot more, it's, it's, it is expensive to do GLP. Um, and it, it's required from, for a submittable data, for, for submittable data. But if you're just doing, um, you know, a quick two, two sheep test or three mice, or even a, a, a hate, and, 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 um, hate entering all these animals, but, you know, um, a dog study, um, uh, we did a, we, you know, one of our client, one of our previous, one of my previous companies, we did, um, three dog studies for um, hip replacements. And we didn't do them under GLP because we weren't going to submit the data um, with the dogs. We were going to submit data from, uh, from human clinicals. But we still ran the test and we actually found a lot of really good information by running the dog studies. Um, and I will tell you that two of the dogs, uh, uh, at least as far as I know, two of the dogs are still alive. Uh, with, with our hips in them. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Uh, for developing surface modification treatments for class two devices, what kind of design requirements or software can be useful? So design requirements, if you're making surface, uh, I guess I'm going to need a little bit more information, but if you're making surface uh, uh, changes, if you're, your product, if you're, design, if your thing is sort of modifying existing products, um, you're, you're sort of in a middle zone with the FDA. Some of the requirements you're going to need is how you are going to consistently ensure that you can, um, you can modify that surface. What type of surface um, uh, um, pre- pre-surface activities, you're pre-activities pre -activities you're going to have to do that surface to ensure that you can uh, modify it. Uh, long-term effects, um, more than likely you're going to be asked about long-term um, situations, long-term uh, reliability. I, I bring that up because one of my first medical jobs um, in 1990, uh, was working with Johnson and Johnson um, before they bought Depew, and uh, and then when they did buy Depew on the metal and metal hip, and if you guys remember, uh, the metal and metal hip was for 
10 years uh, was a great idea, great product. Um, and then 10 years on, uh, they realized that the uh, titanium and the cobalt chrome uh, were creating small little nodules that were floating around the body and causing, uh, causing illness. That's a 10 year time period. Um, since then, um, FDA is asking questions about that, asking about leachables, extractables, asking about how long something is going to last um, before it has to be replaced and, and what type of risks did you think about in the long term? I'm not sure if I totally answered that question, so I apologize. Okay, uh, next question I see. Uh, how do we include or relate the sp specific aims in STTR or SBIT proposals to design control? So there, the, in, those, in those guidelines, they're gonna ask you certain questions. I mean, I'm going through one right now where um, they are asking about risk and they're asking about, um, in some respects, classifications and, and, and regulatory pathways. Um, and they are related to design, but not, 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 I wouldn't necessarily call them design control questions. I don't know if that's the right term, but, but you, there are questions that, the, 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 that are going to be asked that are, are not necessarily design control, um, but are related more towards the regulatory side of things. Again, I'm, I apologize if I'm not answering that question exactly the way um, you might be looking for, but I would need a little bit more information to, to gather a, a better answer. Okay, uh, we have one more question in the Q&A window in about uh, 12 minutes to the top of the hour. So if there are any additional questions, please submit those now. Uh, but this question asks uh, for early R&D work conducted from within a university, uh, where is the point that you see where it would be difficult to comply with design control requirements within the context of a university research lab? See, I don't see any problem at all. Um, I do uh, my second company uh, was developed within MIT and uh, Oxford University. And we started design controls. It was a software product. Uh, we started design controls while in the university. Um, and then we rolled it out of the university and, um, and continued with the design controls. There was no, there was no, um, there was no loss of time and no, no, no barriers for us to document the, the development of the product appropriately. So I don't necessarily see a problem there. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A window. Uh, we do have our feedback poll open. So if you haven't uh, completed that, uh, please submit your responses. Uh, so at this time, I think I'll turn things over to Marissa who has some uh, closing comments. Thank you. Oh, wait, actually, before you do that, I did a uh, question just popped up. <laughs> I just saw um, that. <laughs> should the design control components be included in a pre-sub meeting? Uh, yes. The, the reason why, the, the, so, so a pre-sub, um, an early, even, even early feasibility pre-subs, um, you're asking questions. And some of the best questions that you come up with are based upon, are, are going to impact your design control. So in other words, you might be able to be, you might ask the FDA um, what type of testing they would want to see in, um, in your particular product. Um, you know, for example, I mentioned 60601 before, which is electrical safety. There are approximately 26 different standards within that uh, 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 realm of, of, of testing, um, and, and you might not need to do all of them. So the FDA might come back to you and say, look, you only need to do 1, 7, 15, and 12. Um, you don't need to do the rest of them. So that will have a direct impact upon how well you design your product or what type of features you can put into your product. 
Another thing that's actually happening very, very uh, frequently now, recently, uh, with pre-subs is cybersecurity. Uh, any type of product, medical device product that has any type of software and it's connected at all, anywhere, even, even into a hospital's intranet, um, has to have some level of cybersecurity. Unfortunately, the FDA's view on cybersecurity is still nebulous, and it takes it, it's very advantageous to ask the FDA right off the bat what type of security they would like to see so that you can design it straight into your product as opposed to retrospectively having to bolt on something afterwards, um, which makes things really, really difficult. Okay, uh, at this point, I don't see any additional questions. Uh, so Marissa, if you had any closing comments, please take it away. Absolutely, thank you so much, David. And thank you, Patrick, for turning the stage over to me for a few upcoming events and reminders affiliated with the Catalyze program. So our next seminar is going to be part of the summer webinar series, which is currently in development. So please stay tuned to hear more about that. Our next um, publication is coming out in May, and that will be our summer newsletter. If you're not on our email list, both of these items that I just spoke about will be emailed in advance. So please join our email list on the front page of our website at nhlbicatalyze.org. And of course, if you have a question or want to speak to a member of our team further, our email addresses are on the screen, <clears throat> excuse me, are on the screen, and we'd be happy to have more of an in-depth conversation with you about any questions or uh, further remarks that we can't answer here. And with that, thank you so much. If everyone had a chance to take a um, a look at that evaluation poll, we would really appreciate it. And Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you.